Welcome back. This is video 2 of subtopic 1.5 on atomic spectroscopy. We're going to focus on this science understanding. The wavelengths of radiation emitted and absorbed by an element are unique to that element and can be used to identify its presence in a sample. We need to explain why some wavelengths of radiation emitted and absorbed by an element are unique to that element. I've already discussed that flame colours could be used as a means of determining the presence of elements, but we know this is quite limited because certain elements can give off quite similar colours. So emission spectroscopy utilises the characteristic emission spectra of elements as a means of identifying them instead of just based on their colour. This is an example of an emission spectrum uh, for hydrogen, and what we can see here are the different transitions that its electron can have. Of particular interest is what we call the Balmer series, which is this one here, because when we look at its transitions, we can see that the wavelengths that are given off um, correspond to visible light. So this is of particular interest to us. We've got other series, which are called the Lyman series, which um, its energy transitions correspond to higher energy or shorter wavelength. Uh, ultraviolet radiation, and the passion series, which is longer wavelength, lower energy, infrared. By looking at the light emitted from hydrogen through a diffraction grating, this splits the light into distinct bands that correspond to specific wavelengths. The absorption spectrum shows that the wavelengths of radiation um, that hydrogen is capable of absorbing corresponds to the same wavelengths that we see in the emission spectrum. This image here shows you the line emission spectra of other various elements that we could use to help identify these particular elements in a sample. In summary, the wavelengths of radiation emitted and absorbed by an element are unique to that element. That can be explained by the unique electron configurations result in unique energy transitions for an element's electrons. Therefore, no two elements will exhibit the same line emission or absorption spectrum. We can think of line emission spectrum as a kind of fingerprint or a barcode. This is going to be used to help identify the presence of a particular element in a sample. To our second and final understanding, atomic absorption spectroscopy is used for quantitative analysis. We need to explain the principles of atomic absorption spectroscopy in identifying elements in a sample, and also describe the construction and use of calibration graphs in determining the concentration of an element in a sample. Atomic absorption spectroscopy was created and developed by a British-Australian CSIRO scientist by the name of Sir Alan Walsh, and this took place in the 1950s. This is just a photo of Sir Alan Walsh here. Atomic absorption spectroscopy, or AAS for short, can be used to determine the presence of a particular element, which we can think of as qualitative analysis, and or determine its concentration in a sample, which is a quantitative analysis. It can test the presence and concentration of over 70 different metallic elements in solution or in solid samples. It is extremely sensitive. It can detect the presence in the parts per million and parts per billion ranges. I'll be using this diagram to explain the process of AAS. We're going to start over to the left-hand side with the hollow cathode lamp. A hollow cathode lamp is used to create a beam of electromagnetic radiation of a particular wavelength or of particular wavelengths. It contains a cathode that is coated with the metal to be analysed so that the beam emits wavelengths characteristic of that element. For example, a sodium cathode lamp will emit wavelengths of radiation characteristic of sodium atoms. The radiation from the cathode lamp is then passed through an atomizer or a reducing flame. So that's this section of our atomic absorption spectrometer. The atomizer is generally made up of a flame or graphite electrodes. Its purpose is to vaporize, which means turn it into a gaseous state, and atomize any metal ions, that is, reduce metal ions to metal atoms um, in the sample to be analysed. The sample being analysed is drawn up through a nebulizer, 
which mixes it with an acetylene air mixture, sprays the mixture into the atomizer to produce an atomized sample. In the diagram we can see our sample. This is being injected through to our uh, nebulizer and then that sprays the mixture into our flame here. The heat from the flame quickly evaporates the solvent and breaks down the compounds into free atoms. The only atoms in the sample that will absorb the radiation from the cathode lamp are going to be the same types of atoms as those in the cathode lamp. The greater the concentration of those atoms present, the more radiation will be absorbed. And almost instantaneously, the radiation will be re-emitted, but in all directions. If all wavelengths of radiation are absorbed from the sample, the sample contains the same metal present in the cathode lamp. If no radiation is absorbed, the cathode lamp could be changed until this occurs. So we could just keep changing the lamp until we actually get radiation absorbed. The transmitted radiation, so that's the radiation that's not being absorbed, which is this one here, then travels through to a monochromator. This consists of a diffraction grating, or a prism, which acts to separate the radiation into individual wavelengths. A key wavelength of the metal to be measured is then selected for, and that's going to be unique to the element of interest. This helps eliminate the interference of any background radiation that could be coming through. The radiation of that specific wavelength is then sent to a detector. This is labelled as the photomultiplier tube in our diagram. It essentially compares the transmitted radiation, which is going to be of lower intensity, to the incident or um, original radiation, which is of higher intensity, which came from the cathode lamp. The detector is then connected to a computer which produces a readout for the amount of absorbance. And essentially the higher the concentration of the metal that you're analysing, the greater its absorbance value. If we want to determine the concentration of an element in a sample, the atomic absorption spectrometer or spectrophotometer must be calibrated before its use. To do so, we calibrate it by testing it with solutions of known concentration. In other words, we use standard solutions of the element of interest. This often includes a blank, which is just made up of distilled water, and this just confirms that there is no contamination um, of our water to prepare the solutions. Absorptions are then measured, and we construct what we call a calibration curve or graph, and then we use that to determine the presence as well as the concentration of a particular element of interest in our sample. We can see an example of a calibration curve here and just note that there are a few key features whenever we look at constructing calibration curves. Starting off with our axes, we can see that we have both axes that are labelled including units for concentration which can be given as parts per million, parts per billion or other forms. Absorbance has no units because it's comparing the incident radiation with the transmitted radiation. We also need to ensure that we've got a suitable scale so that our graph will take up most of the graphing space. We will have to accurately plot our points and include a line of best fit. And we can see here that the line of best fit is actually linear. And this is what you should find whenever you need to construct a calibration curve. From there we use the line of best fit and we can use interpolation as well as to some degree extrapolation to determine the concentration of a sample based on its absorbance. We will spend some class time and work through some examples of constructing calibration curves and also using them to uh, determine the presence and the amount of certain elements within a sample. So until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.